Look away unto Jesus and say, Lord, because you have died on that cross, I am capable of receiving everything that cross has purchased for me. And sometimes God speaks over us and we're not willing to listen to wisdom. All of this is available to us through all of this good, awesome kingdom glory. Wonderful Jesus. Can you go to 2 Timothy? And... Um, <clears throat> God is really, really good. Uh, I I just want to say back to some of you guys who testified that without you, there's no victory in doing ministry. There's always victory in Christ for me personally, but when it comes to ministry and and I look at your faces and, you know, sometimes we're worshiping and we start service, there's only 30 people here and then it just starts... You just keep coming, but every person that comes in carries something so special, and I, I, I wish I could define it. I wish I could express it better, um, but there's no insignificant person, That's right, right. N- not even to me, so how much more to the kingdom of God? Now, do you all know the scripture, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you? Now, the context of that, either side of it, is all about the Gentiles are seeking after food, they're seeking after clothing, they're seeking after things. Yeah. They're, they're after the stuff. Yeah, right. And the stuff seems to be what they're primarily focused on. And he says, seek first, can you say first? first. Seek yes. first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things they will be added to you. You can find that in uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Now, what happens is, the second we start to look at these scriptures with a little bit more of a magnifying glass, if you just could amplify or magnify some of those words, it would help you to realize just what Jesus was actually saying. Jesus was actually saying something strong. And sometimes you hear something over and over and over. Yeah, yeah, seek first the kingdom of God. Yeah, yeah, yep. Right. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. Well, first of all, it doesn't say seek God. Right. Come on. It says seek what God seeks. Right. Hmm. Wow. That's pretty amazing. He doesn't say seek God. Seek what I seek. My kingdom. So God is seeking to advance his kingdom. And he wants us to seek what he's seeking. And there's something about it that's a lot like Marge. (laughs) And a lot of you can relate to this. You know, you can do all kinds of stuff for your woman. But if you don't seek what they're seeking, it's all a hill of beans. <laughs> and it's almost like, in order for me to seek her kingdom, I have to study what she is seeking. Right. Right. I got to look for it. I got to almost, I'm almost analyzing her to find out what makes her happy. Now, this might sound strange to you. But I'll hand her a cup of coffee and she'll go, you love me. (laughs) Now, that consists of boiling water, (laughs) scooping, and scooping, and pouring, and pouring, stirring, and she loves me. (laughs) Right? So I know one of the things that makes her feel loved is when I give her coffee. Now you say, well, when do you do that? Whenever is good for her. Okay, so she'll take it anytime. Um, yeah, you too, Lisa. Yep, okay, Mike, the assignment's on. And uh, <laughs> so you, you got to know what your loved one loves and go love it. Yeah. Now, there's something else I've studied her and I figured out, and that is if you ignore the household, the condition... If, it doesn't matter how good it is. If, if undone things remain that way too long, 
that's a problem. So you got to know what it is. Also, you want to love her, you you got to be generous. If I, if I say anything that in any way restricts the flow of money towards people or towards kids or grandkids or someone's need, that harms what she sees. So I've learned, give her lots of coffee and be generous to people <laughs> and fix things, and I'm seeking her kingdom. <laughs> okay, so it's not difficult. <laughs> it's, it's like kind of true, right? It's kind of true. And, uh, and, and at least put that laundry away in the morning that's on the floor, at least. Be better if it was done at night, but in the morning. So what I'm trying to tell you is seek first the kingdom of God. So then, therefore, you should be studying in God's word for what turns him on. Right? Okay, so he said, seek what I'm seeking. Seek my kingdom. Seek what it is that I seek. Well, he seeks to be at peace with all men. He seeks forgiveness and not judgment. I didn't say he doesn't judge. I said he prefers mercy over judgment. So what does he want from me? He wants me to prefer mercy over judgment. He wants me to be forgiving, gracious. The Bible says he's slow to anger. That means he wants me to seek that. He wants me to be seeking what he seeks. Be slow to anger. Be quick to hear. Slow to speak. You know, he listens. He's a listener. So seek first what God seeks, his kingdom. And all that other stuff you want, he says, I'll give to you. All right, so he says another thing. He says, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness. Seek first his kingdom, what he's seeking, and his righteousness. Okay, so let's put the magnifying glass on there. I've taught you many times the word of righteousness, that word is highly, highly misunderstood. People think it means do good things, don't do bad things. It does not mean that. Unequivocally does not mean that. The word in the Greek is dekeo. It's righteousness, which means justice. Now, when you see America has lady justice, right? What does she have? A scale. Justice is a scale. And it has two pans there with the chains, and it's saying these two are equal. So whatever you put on the scale, this other thing has to equal it. So justice means someone accuses you of something, and justice means you're going to get your just reward, which is prison or whatever, for doing it. Or if someone accuses you and you didn't do it, justice is you're going to get acquitted and found innocent. So justice means you're going to get an equality for what it is that you are. Okay, so that's what justice means. So the word dikeo uh, means justice, equity, righteousness. All three words are applicable in the scriptures to be translated out of that word. So, but dikeo in its truest form, equity or equality means two things that equal each other. Righteousness means God sees himself in you. And you can see yourself in him. Because you are the mere image of him through Christ. So when Christ came into your heart, God immediately sees you as a son. Sonship beams back at him. It's equity. Sameness. Equality. He said, seek first what I seek. And equality and a mere image face-to-face relationship with me. If you do that, I'll add everything to you. Yeah? Okay, so it makes you hear that scripture new, fresh, and changes our mind about what it is that we're busy doing. Uh, Righteousness is a mere image relationship. What decal means, mirror image, or two same two people seeing the same thing in each other. Seek first what Christ has made available to you, righteousness. A mirror image relationship with me. 
and what I seek. Powerful, right? All right, so 2 Timothy. Um, man, the Lord is just amazingly gracious to us. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we'll pick up a verse 6. Well, I want to just include about the, the rules of engagement. So we're going to go back to 3. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier in Christ. Does anybody here like hardship? No. Uh, I, I don't. I, I really don't. But the Bible promises us that we will have trials, and so he says endure hardship as a good soldier. So how does a good soldier endure it? Well, he obeys the commands when it's very difficult, and in the end, he's a part of the victory. Right. Yeah. Okay? So he says endure it like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaging in warfare entangles himself in the affairs of this life. So this does not mean you don't work. It does not mean you don't pay bills. It does not mean you don't get involved with things in this world. What he's saying is you don't engage in the affairs of this world. All right, so right now is a great time to talk about this because uh, sometimes Christians try to make Jesus political. And what they're actually doing is engaging in the affairs of this world. It doesn't mean we don't study who's running for office, and we don't vote, and we don't do the right thing, and we have civil responsibilities. We should. The Christianity has produced these wonderful opportunities. Okay, so I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about the over-obsessing uh, obsessing over the argument from side to side and the entanglement into the whole um, right. right versus left, this versus that, until your heart gets sick because you're like, I can't do anything about this. What are you kidding? We got Christ in us. <laughs> you know, so see, when you get entangled in the affairs of this life, you go from inspecting faith and, and, and uh, um, quality of leadership and things that people should have to become an office, you move out of that into this personal vendetta and fight. Yep. And I think that the second we cross over, we're entangled. So that's one example. Uh, another way to get entangled, there's all kinds of things you can do where your heart goes further into a matter than it should. And I think if we'll learn how to stay out of entanglement, then we're going to have these blessings come to pass. So he says, no one engaging, engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also... If anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. And <clears throat> so it's important that while we're busy prophesying over people, while we're busy laying hands on the sick, while we're busy doing all the things of the Spirit, that we participate according to the rules. You can get so unhealed and not have a good relationship with Jesus. Yeah, right. You can preach and not have a good relationship with Jesus. Right. And, and so... The competing according to rules means, you, you remember where he says in the book of Matthew, he says, depart from me, I never knew you. What and what did they quote? Prophecy, miracles, healings, speaking in tongues. They, they talk about all the spiritual things. And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. He's saying, you didn't compete according to the rules. I said, stay engaged with me. Let your heart be open to my heart. I want to influence you. It's not just about the gifts you can manifest. Thank God for those. But it's about staying connected to the one. So I'm seeking to prophesy because I'm seeking what he's seeking, his kingdom. So I'm aware of him while I'm prophesying. I'm not just prophesying so I can attract people. I'm not just prophesying so I can grow my church or, or grow my little home Bible fellowship or whatever, or win my neighbor to become a part of the club I'm a part of. I'm seeking what he's seeking. So there's an attitude behind my prophetic word. There's an attitude behind my prayers. There's an attitude behind what I'm doing because I'm competing according to rules. I'm staying in connection to the head. I'm going for God. I'm seeking what God is seeking. Amen. So verse 6, he says, A hardworking farmer must be the first partaker of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. He's saying you can't preach the gospel and sow the seeds of the word of God and not be the first partaker to live them. Right, 
What good is it to say what you don't do or you don't want to do or you're not a part of? Now, look, sometimes when you're preaching, I'm going to tell you right now, the gospel is higher than us all. It's up here. And he's not saying refrain from preaching it because you haven't come into its fullness yet. He, but he's, you're aiming at that. You're seeking what he's seeking. You're going after that thing. Right. If you'll do it that way, then you can preach the full counsel of God, even though you don't fully live the full counsel yet. But your heart's attitude is to keep on climbing into a place where you are living out and demonstrating this gospel. You are first partaker. So let us not just be spouting off about things we've not uh, had any experience with, or at least we are not full-fledged with God's help pursuing to go after. Amen. Yeah. All right, so I preach raising the dead. To this day, I don't know that I've ever raised anybody from the dead, but I believe in the raising of the dead. I'm not boasting. I'm saying the gospel includes the raising of the dead, but I'm after all that he's after. I want that to become a part of what I'm right. part of. Yeah. Now, we, we have prayed for a lot of people in Africa, and the reaction of people kind of told me that something bigger than what we were praying for happened. So I never asked questions, just they were alive, so we thank God for it. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer. Do you realize that if you preach the truth correctly, you will sometimes be spoken of as an evildoer? So don't ever uh, let people's statements about somebody being an evildoer influence you. Don't be influenced by negative talk. Yeah. They might be actually the one who's doing the right thing. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. See, if we're seeking what he's seeking, then we've got to be aware of what he's saying. Yes. Yes. He's saying there's an attitude inside of stewards of God that must be present for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect that they also may obtain the salvation to which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So there's going to be a cost. Okay, If you're seeking what he's seeking, there is a cost associated with serving people. You know, some people don't even thank you. They don't even care. They don't even act like they care. They never uh, give you any uh, respect for what you're actually doing for them. But we continue and we do it as a good soldier, and we endure all things that we might obtain the reward uh, because God wants to reach people because you once were hard, and you were once were difficult, and you once weren't listening. You once didn't want to cooperate, but somebody suffered for you, and here you are. And so God wants us to endure and to suffer this also. God does not test you. God does not try you. That's old covenant talk. Don't let anybody ever tell you in the New Testament, God tests people in the New Testament. That is rubbish. You will not find, once we come to the New Testament, I'm not talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because that was a transitionary period where Jesus was introducing the New Testament to old covenant saints until he would be resurrected, resurrected from the dead after that. And you won't find that until the book of Acts, or in Romans and Acts. And so... Um, You'll find all the way through from the beginning of the Old Testament to the end of it, testing. God tested their hearts. God tested them, tested them, tested them, tested them, tested them. And you think, well, why is God testing people? Because he didn't know what was in them. You don't test something if you know the answer. You test it if you don't know the answer. Remember, before we were born again, God was not in our spirit. Man was cut off had a covenant through the law with God, and so God would test them to see their reaction or to see where he could count on them. And according to how they responded to the test, he could then move forward with them and use them. Like, for example, when Joshua and Caleb were the only one of 12 who went into the land of Canaan and came back and said, we are well able to take the land, the test proved to him those guys would do his will. But the test also proved to them those other ten were not fit to be a part of what he was doing. So they all died in the wilderness. Then Joshua and Caleb took the uh, children of God into Jericho, and they took the city, and they then went on to take all the land. And so God worked that way. When you come to the New Testament, the reason God doesn't test us anymore is because he knows what he's invested into us. That's his spirit inside of us. He doesn't have to test that. He knows what he has. He knows what he's working with. He now is developing his people, sanctifying them. 
So I got a little overhead for you today, if you can throw that up for me. And uh, I'll show you this little, um, we're going to have a little bit of insight here. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's um, Bob Coban. <laughs> no, no, it's Keith. <laughs> It's got to be one of the leadership. That's the only one I can pick on. Um, but anyway, old Bob here. Um, you can see that you have a spirit, you have a soul, and you have a body. Now you can find that in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Uh, Paul the Apostle says, My prayer to God is that you might be saved completely, spirit, soul, and body. So the Apostle Paul defines that within man these three aspects. And you can find these three aspects inside of God as well. And that's why they're in us, because they're in God. So there are definitely three distinct parts to God. There are three distinct parts to us. There's one me with three parts, and there's one God with three parts. There are not three persons called the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is not biblical. There is one God, one person, who has a spirit and has a soul, or the word of God. And so you need to understand that. In this present age, people are teaching stuff that are actually not in the Bible. And the reason you need to know this is because we are made in the similitude of God. As we are, so is he. I am like him. What he is is what I am. Now, I don't have someone else inside of me, but my spirit does talk from time to time understand it's the spirit of Chris and it's the spirit of God it's the same exact situation and so I want you to know that your spirit your soul and your body are affected differently by your salvation now on the bottom there you can see I've got your spirit is saved your soul is being saved and your body will be saved and that's a reality that we have to get into us and the reason that this is important is because Sometimes when, after someone gives their life to Christ and then you sin or you do something wrong and, and you feel really terrible and you think, well, am I saved or not? I think, what, what's wrong with me? I'm still thinking horrible things. I'm still doing horrible things. Well, your soul is actually the control center of you. Um, if we pull the soul out of you, you're just a spirit like everybody else. What gives you your flavor, your thoughts, your desires, your hopes, your dreams? What makes special about you that we can identify? If I close my eyes and talk to you, your soul is speaking to me. It's what you love. It's what you like. It's what you're about. It's what you hate. You would express everything from that soul's perspective because your soul is the go-between. Your soul is that tangible part that can touch the spirit man or touch the natural man. And so my spirit is able to convene with God, is able to have fellowship with God. In my spirit is Jesus Christ. The Bible says, he who confesses Christ is one spirit together with him. Right, right. Okay, so in my spirit, I have union with Christ. My spirit cannot have a demon, never will ever have a demon again, right. because God is in my spirit. Right. If you belong to Jesus Christ, you cannot be possessed. You cannot be. Amen. Prior to that, <laughs> well, <laughs> everything's possible. <laughs> but you are not demon-possessed. Right, right. You are not demon-controlled in your spirit. You are born again, saved. Amen. The day you give your life to Christ, you are as righteous and holy and good and blessed and deserving and equal with God as you can ever be. Yep. Did you say equal with God? Yes. That's what righteousness is. It's mirror reflection. I am what he is. He is what I am. I've become it. I'm not going to be it. I am it. But I still have a body and I still have a soul. Now my soul has not yet been saved. My spirit just got saved. My mind is panicking. <laughs> Most people, when they get saved, their mind's panicking. And even if their body's trembling, giving evidence to the fact they don't understand their soul. So it's very important to understand then that what has happened to you is salvation, righteousness has come to make its home in you. Yes. Yes. God, Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Amen. Amen. Now, you can memorize the whole Bible, do all the good works, cooperate with God 
flawlessly, you will not improve your spirit condition at all. Right. At all. You are a new creation in your inner man. Your spirit is a new creation. All things have already passed away. All things have already become new. Yes. Yes. Now, right. but what you have to understand is your soul is still a collection of trouble. And all your old thoughts, all your old ways, all the old stuff is still batting around inside of you. And, and, and you can have strongholds there. That's where demons can affect you. And that's why Christians sometimes have demons. It's not because it's possession of the spirit. It's because of strongholds in the mind. And so we have to deal with demonic strongholds in the mind. And we have to deal with demonic teachings and demonic instruction that we've received from our forefathers, our society, and from everything else that's collecting in our soul. So here's your soul. You know, the day you're born, you're a clean slate. Yep. Yep. You don't even know how to talk. You don't know how to walk. You don't know how to think. You just see this face. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you grow to trust that face yes. because that face feeds you. Yeah. Yeah. That face makes you feel more comfortable that face seems to care for your environment. Mm -hmm. And you don't understand even that. You don't even know what food is. You just know it feels good going down. Yeah. <laughs> and you start to associate that shape and that face with goodness. Mm -hmm. And little by little, lines, it's almost like a computer being educated with information. And inside your soul, you're collecting data. Data, 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 mama, mama, dada. And you're collecting data, 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 Uncle Chris, Uncle Aunt Marge. You know, you're, you're collecting the data. And pretty soon, your social environment has completely framed what you think to be real and true. If you were raised in a certain African tribe in a certain nation, you, and you are a male, you know at a certain time, when it's time to get married, that you're going to have to go up 60 to 80 feet, tie a, a vine around your leg, and dive off all the way down head first. And when it comes to the end of that cord to get married, the, the whole vine will stretch, and you pummel into the ash. And if you live through it, you're worthy of getting married. So... So if you were raised, your soul was in that society, being raised by those people, at the end of the day, you'd be thinking about jumping from the tower with the vine on your leg. Because you would be persuaded inside of you it's necessary to do that to get married. Now, that's a complete fallacy. It was invented by demons. It was evil to the core. It's killed many people, harmed, damaged, and maimed many people. Uh, but if you can live through it, you're worthy to be a husband because everybody <laughs> knows that if he isn't willing to jump when you say jump, he's not worthy of marrying. <laughs> All right, so you can understand that culture creates your reality in your soul. So how does information get into my soul? All right, the primary way information gets into my soul is through my ears. Secondary is my eyes. Well, you can put them all in primary. I don't care. But it isn't so much you see. It's what you hear. If you see mommy's face and she's going, I'll kill you, you hear that. <laughs> you know? But if mommy's saying, I love you, you know, it's, there's information being fed through your eyes and through your ears into your soul. So you got your five physical senses. It's what you see. It's what you taste. It's what you smell. It's what you touch, and it's what you hear. It's all here in your head. You can feel it with your hands, too. But all those five senses are right in your head. Yeah. And you are perceiving through the five physical senses what life is or is not. Now, a lot of it is a complete lie. Yeah. It's been developed sure. by the opinion of man, by yeah. religious traditions, or by just yeah. stereotypes of thought and or cultural ideas from, from handed down from years and years and years and years. So the problem is, you end up looking like that. <laughs> Your soul is cluttered. Does anybody relate to this? Yeah. So then you grew up wondering, well, well, why do I have to do that? I don't like it. And there's social pressure to do things. And there's all these feelings and emotions. And at the end of the day, basically you're confused. Now, to add and compile to your problem, 
your spirit before you were saved is in darkness. And so when it comes to anything in the spirit realm, if, you get, if anything gets through there, it's cultish, wicked, evil, and dark. It promotes lust. What? What's the Bible say? The lust of the eyes, the lust of the, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Right? So those come into you from spiritual means. So now I do my five physical senses bring to me whatever, but the spiritual aspect is bringing me darkness. Now the Bible says that we were once alienated from God, lost in our wicked works in darkness. We were lost. What's he talking about? Your soul. That's the condition of your soul. That soul is the decision-making center of you. Without your soul saying yes, your spirit can't do anything. Without your, spirit, without your soul saying yes, your body will not do anything. Yep. All right, lift your hand. Yes? Yeah, see, you're, I'm just saying, I have to say yes. My soul has to say yes. I have to approve. It, approval comes out of the soul realm. Yep. You understand sure. that? Yeah. Your mind, will, and emotions are in the soul realm. The problem is my emotions are there too. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what's to be done? Our soul has to be saved. How does it get saved? By applying God's word to every ridiculous thought that is inside of me. Now, it, we call that sanctification. The Bible calls it sanctification, renewal of the mind. Um, and, and so if, but if you don't get your mind renewed, then you're just a product of your society. It's really funny. It's like, I always think it's really funny when, and look, I'm not judging, I'm just saying it, it's just evident to me. When I see everybody with their hat on sideways, tattoos, pants hanging down, underwear out, and walking like that. And they say, why are you like that? I'm free. I do what I want. No, you're a slave, just like everybody else. <laughs> it's funny. Everybody who's free does the same thing you do because there's no such thing. It's, it's the product of the soul realm uh, being influenced by an idea to be a certain way. So we ourselves are that way. We've been influenced by our society to wear clothes. Now, I'm really glad you wore your clothes today. Thank you. It's cold enough. You will. But, um, but if we were in a society where everyone was naked, and there are some in the world, they're naked, and they don't wear clothes, and they don't think anything of it. They grow up naked. And uh, I don't recommend it. <laughs> because you'll notice that those societies are depraved, and they don't have God, and they don't have the, the knowledge of the truth of God's word. I notice that when you believe God's word, you put clothes on. Okay, can we take it a step further? I noticed that the more you believe the word of God, the less you dress like the world. Well, let me rephrase it. The less you dress worldly. The world teaches you to push your sexuality in how you dress. God teaches you to dress with modesty. I tell you, we are still falling prey to this. Yeah. We still are. It's because in your soul, you've been trained to think, I can dress how I want to dress. Well, you can, but you can also not seek what God's seeking. Yeah. What is God seeking? He's seeking you to not become a barrier or an obstacle or a stumbling block to any person. Amen. Right? All right, so then... Men and women ought to be affected how they dress to be modest because the Bible teaches about modesty. Yeah. And it doesn't mean boring. Yeah. Yeah, so then you see whole groups of Christians walking out and they're all wearing the exact same blue cut skirt and the exact <laughs> same bun in their hair. They come walking out and they look like robots. And it, you know it's wrong when you see it. It's like, oh, it's, you know what that is? Slavery. Yeah, yeah. Amen. So God doesn't want to bring us into slavery, but God doesn't bring us into false liberty where we're causing our brother to stumble. Yeah. So what's to be done? Adhere to the word of God. Yeah. Seek what God's seeking. Now you can apply that to every single thing in life. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So then when you're making a decision whether to choose this or that, well, you don't choose that because you're a godly person. Right. So yeah, but it looks so good on me. Yeah, but I'm pleasing God. I'm after what he's after. Yeah. And if I'll go after what he's after and I'll seek his righteousness, then all these things are going to be added to me. Yeah. So people say, why aren't my prayers answered? Because you dress bad.
Well, look, I'm, I'm not making laws. I'm just saying, unless you compete according to the rules, you won't receive the reward. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, all right, so, all right, it's not about what you wear, but it's about the attitude of your heart that doesn't want to be a stumbling block to anybody else. So then, if your attitude in why I'm doing this Christian thing is for him, for his kingdom's sake, that I'm not doing it for my sake, and when it's decision time, I don't do it for my sake, I do it for his sake. So, is, you know, it'll affect how many buttons you button. <laughs> it'll affect the position of your pants. <laughs> One day we were playing basketball. We were playing basketball with these young guys. And, you know, I'm a pretty big guy. I was shoving these guys out. I won't let them in. And I'm not that good a basketball player, but I can wrestle. And <laughs> so I'm shoving them out. And he's like, he was so fast to try to get around me. And his, his underwear were getting further and further. The jeans were, it was like way down here. And just quick, I went, hey, your underwear are hanging out. And he went, oh, pulls his pants up. And he went, Pfft. And I said, boy, you know, it's amazing. Your conscience pulled those pants straight up. <laughs> See, he had a conscience. But some lie told him, I deserve to be this way. I agree. You deserve to be that way. <laughs> All right, so I'm not even talking. I'm not even talking about clothes today. Yeah, I'm not talking about clothing. I'm talking about the renewal of our mind. I'm talking about the salvation of our soul. Our soul is being saved from what? Rebellion, social influence, and religious weirdness. All of it. And what do we become? The most normal, amicable, approachable people. Why? Because we're seeking what God's seeking, not our own self-centeredness. Amen. And sometimes a woman will say, well, i got to get my man. And that's exactly the kind of man you're going to get. One who doesn't honor you for your true beauty, but just for your physical beauty. Look, you don't have to... You don't have to um, advertise. A man has you totally figured out. You can wear a burlap sack. He's got you figured out. <laughs> Am I lying? No. Look, we're not stupid people. <laughs> so Pastor Chris, you shouldn't talk about this. Yes! we got to talk about these things in church. Yeah, this is where we should learn. Yeah. Now, some of you believe <laughs> Some of you believe that you got to make out to get to know her. Well, I'm wondering how you're going to get to know me. See, it's a lie. You don't get to know anybody with your lips. Right, right. It's a lie. That. <laughs> wow. Praise the Lord. I think I heard you can make out with anything. <laughs> All right. We bring it back to the Bible. Uh. So anyway, this is what you end up looking like. <laughs> oh, Bob here. His spirit is saved. His mind is full of clutter. Right? His mind is full. Can you turn to Ephesians chapter 4? And it says here, now either this, either this is in the Bible for a reason, or it's just some language just the Apostle Paul wrote for nothing. Verse 21. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to its deceitful lust. Yep. Yep. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you might put on the new man, which was created in Christ Jesus. Okay. So it does not say put off the old man. It doesn't say that. It says put off the conduct of the old man. You don't have an old man. No. Right, no. You think, what are you talking about? Where do you think sin comes from? From your soul. Yeah, but I thought sin came from my spirit in union with sin. Yeah. That my spirit in union with sin. 
All right, my old man was my spirit in darkness. God killed my old man. My old man, my spirit in union with darkness, was crucified and killed that I might be made alive with Christ. And now Christ is in my spirit. That's the new man. The new man is Christ in my spirit. The old man was darkness in my spirit. The nature of sin used to be in me. Now the nature of Christ is in me. The old man was crucified and taken away. The new man is alive. Because you have a new spirit. You are a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. But now your soul. So sin in the unbeliever comes from their spirit. Sin in in the Christian comes from their soul. It's the past training It's the former conduct. It's the former ways that are still polluting my judgments today. I need to receive God's word into my soul so that my soul can be renewed. The Bible does not say renew your mind. The Bible says be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed. That's allow this thing. In other words, when the word of God's coming, it has the power to cleanse you from things that are oppressing you. Allow it. it. Be renewed. Allow that thing to enter your soul and begin to confront those lies which you were trained by your forefathers. And that's how you get renewed. You allow it. You know, sometimes an opportunity comes, you'll be at a conference or at church or at a Bible study or you're reading a Bible and all of a sudden the Holy Ghost opens to you. So here's the Spirit of God like revealing to you something. You're like, whoa. Now that might be your only chance this year to get free. And when that door closes, because you didn't do anything with it, you now go on your way and say, oh, I'll deal with it later. You might not be able to. Because you can't choose to be renewed. You must accept the work of the Spirit, which is trying to renew you. It's the work of the Spirit. It's not the work of the flesh. So I'm not going to decide from the flesh someday, that's it, I'm taking this thing on. You won't. It's the Spirit that's opening opportunities to us to get better. All right, does anybody here want your soul to get better? Yeah, Yeah, all right, then that means you're going to have to pay attention. I think you have to have a notebook and a pen. You've got to take notes when the Spirit speaks. Write it down. Sometimes I have had visions and forgotten them. And I'm going back through my notes and go, what? How can I forget that? Oh, oh, oh." I'm like, oh, my God. I'm like, how did that happen? And I forget. Do you know, I remember one time I was saying, gee, I haven't had an encounter with God. I just, I want a bigger encounter. You know, God audibly spoke to me one time and I forgot. Yeah. How do you forget God audibly spoke to you? <laughs> because I slide into the soul realm. I just, you're not paying attention. But thank God, I, I write all this stuff down and I, I regularly review my notes and things. And it reminds me of these treasures that he has worked in my heart. So if you want your soul to be changed, then you're going to have to pay attention to the Word of God. You're going to have to be diligent with what you're taught because it takes diligence to conquer the old thoughts of the old man. The old man's gone, but the training of the old man remains until it's removed. So we want the old man's training gone. Can you say, I don't have have an an old man, but his thoughts have got to go. So I'm being saved in my soul from what? The training of the old man. That's what the renewing of the mind is. Now the old man relates to this world and demonic voices. The whole entirety of everything you can learn comes from that realm. Whether good or bad, it's all in there. So we thank God for the good, but you got to get rid of all the the garbage that's not truth. Okay? So when we say, when they were in the upper room... They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues. Don't answer. But where were they filled with the Holy Ghost? Was it their body? Was it their spirit? No, the spirit was already filled with God. It's the soul. When you're filled with the Holy Ghost, it means the power of God's breath, His sacred essence, His the essence of God, that's what hagios pneuma, Holy Spirit means hagios pneuma. Hagios is an adjective. It means holy, consecrated, set apart. There's no Chris Carenzi or Holy Ghost. It's not a name. Holy Spirit does not mean a name. It's an adjective. It'd be like, 
it'd be like um, Big Mouth Chris. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's an adjective. Holy is an adjective. Sacred. Sacred what? Sacred spirit. What spirit? Numa. Numa is breath, breeze, essence. Right. So God's saying, my sacred breath or my sacred essence comes into you. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So anybody want the sacred essence of God? Yeah. yeah. Baptize me in the sacred essence. Where does that go? Right straight into your soul, and you become empowered. Do you know something? When someone gets their soul gets filled with the Holy Ghost, what happens is they become strong in their mind. Because you're already strong in spirit, you just don't believe it. Uh, So as long as you're anointed in your soul, you're like, whoa, you got spirit and soul in communion, and your body reacts. Yeah. Yeah, and you become like, you become amazing under the anointing. You get smarter, you're quicker, you get words of knowledge, you're not afraid to pray for people, you could do things you never other. but as soon as that anointing starts to fade, you let it fade, then you become you again in the soul realm. So then your emotions come back in, your doubts come back in, your little feelings come back in. And that's why it, you'll notice in the book of Exodus, it says, and later on, the same people that were filled were filled again. Why? Because their soul got clouded and the Spirit came and filled them again. Where? In the soul realm. And they become empowered and they went out and did great exploits and great works for God. So we got to stay full of the sacred essence in our soul. So that's something that we've got to keep going after. As long as you're in the flesh, you're going to always keep being saved in your soul so that you can do the work of God. Now praise God that your body will be saved. When? In the resurrection. Now, I want you to know this so you don't get confused. The Apostle Paul clearly taught that this body is the purchased possession of God. And I will contradict anybody who ever says sin comes from your flesh. That is rubbish. That is total rubbish. You never, ever have sinned because of your flesh. Never. You sin because of your soul. It's what you dwell on that causes you to sin. Yeah. Not, you're, you never woke up in the middle of the night and you're strangling somebody. Oh, hey, hey stop. You know, your body, you know, your wife's over there. <laughs> you're like, I'm sorry, I didn't have anything to do with my flesh. <laughs> no, it, it, unless you participate with your soul, it right. cannot happen. Yeah. Sin cannot come from the flesh. Now you say, uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 20, verse 18 says, and these are the sins of the flesh, lust, adultery, sensuous, uh, in all these wicked things are listed there. But if you read in Romans chapter 8, verse 5, it says, he who sets his mind on the things of the flesh, walks in the flesh. flesh. Okay, so walking in the flesh means you put your mind on the things of the flesh. Are we together? So... That's what Galatians is talking about. These things which sins come from the flesh are because your mind's on the things of the flesh. You get your mind off things of the flesh, no sin. That's what it says. Yep. Is it right. potential to not sin? No, it's demanded. It's demanded. That's the point. God wants to liberate us from sin yes. completely. Not just in our spirit, but in our soul so that we can act and live like God. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Okay, so when your body gets sown in death, because it says the point of all men to die once, then comes the resurrection. Your body will be resurrected. That body is going to go through a salvation that's equal to a seed becoming a plant. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen? Yeah. Is that helpful? Yeah. So now you know exactly why you have problems. <laughs> so, what's to be done? Study and pursue what God studies and what God pursues, his kingdom. And all these things will be added to you. So um, wealth comes from the soul realm. You know, you own it in your spirit. When you're in union with Christ, you own the whole world already. You're in union with him. The inheritance of the saints is like unmeasurable. But you can't experience any of it until it gets into the soul. And once it gets into the soul, it becomes framed inside of me. And then I'm able 
to then embrace and confess the word of God with my mouth and bring to pass in this realm the action, the conduct, the character of Christ is what produces it. Gifts don't produce it. Character produces it. The character of God produces the kingdom. It manifests fully. The gifts allow us to begin to...